Can Austrian economics help extricate us from the coronavirus crisis? Join Richard Evelyn and me in this week's segment of The Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's segment of The Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you all the principal case for liberty and libertarianism. And I'm joined as I am every week by my co-host, uh, libertarian professor at the Citadel, Richard Eveline. Richard, good to see you again for another round. Good, good to, to see, see you. you. Yeah, and then welcome to our viewers. If you're new to the Future of Freedom Foundation, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and also come to our website at fff.org where we have 30 years of principled statements of libertarianism. And uh, so Richard, you and I, you know, we were together when we started FFF back in 1989. We published our first articles in January of 1990 in our monthly journal. And one of the things that has always distinguished FFF is that we, we present not a solution on how to fix the problems of statism, uh, socialism. I mean, you know, Libertarianism has never been a philosophy that purports to do that. You know, for example, we've got uh, the education crisis that's been with us forever. And people say, well, what, what, is what is the libertarian answer to fixing the public schools? Well, libertarianism doesn't purport to be a philosophy that fixes the public schools or the crises produced by public schools. We've always stood for what might be called a new paradigm, a totally different way of looking at the world, uh, a whole new world that's based on an entirely different set of principles. And one of those principles in economics is Austrian economics. Uh, this was a completely different line of thinking on economics that I ever learned. I was an economics major in college and I didn't ever hear of Austrian economics. It's just a totally different way of looking at the world or a, diff a totally different paradigm or system. And this is what we've been calling for at, since, as you'll recall, since January of 1990, when you and I started writing articles for FFF, always trying to raise people's vision to a higher level and saying, look, the future direction of this country lies not with trying to fix or reform these dysfunctional systems that we live under, but instead replacing this, these systems with a brand new system, a different system. And one of these areas is in economics that you know, we've been guided throughout, uh, I think most of my life, by Keynesian economics. And you'll recall the big uh, textbook in, in college was Samuelson's Principles of Economics. And we were all taught you know, charts and graphs and that this is what economics was all about. And then when I discovered Austrian economics, I realized this is a totally different paradigm. And so you've written a very interesting article uh, that's published by the uh, the American Econ Institute for Economic Research in the last couple of days on Austrian e economics and the coronavirus crisis. So I thought, why don't we delve into that? Because again, we're talking about a new paradigm, Austrian economics, and you've written a really interesting article on how e uh, Austrian economics is the way out of this crisis. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what the article is all about? Okay, well, uh, just as sort of a quick preface, Austrian economics just, just focuses on that all decision-making choices, creative actions are undertaken by individuals, uh, not, not governments, uh, not uh, mythical collective groups or, or nations, but always all things begin with the individual. So the question is, how may individuals successfully and harmoniously interact? And a particularly uh, dynamic way Austrian economics focuses on the opportunities for coordinated voluntary interaction among people both inside and outside of the marketplace. The, the role of the entrepreneur is the creative innovator who has a dream of what he could produce, how to combine the resources uh, to bring a product into existence under the anticipation that he believes that this is what consumers might want and the price they might be willing to pay that would justify his expenses to bring the good to market. Uh, and, and the Austrians have developed, developed this as a way of showing it. I don't, it would be, be too long, but I, I should mention at F, this sponsor, a nine-part video series on the introduction to Austrian economics, 
not that long ago, which can be found on YouTube, uh, in which all of these principles are laid out very systematically and methodically. But that is a nutshell, the emphasis on the power of the market, the, the dynamism of individual creative entrepreneurial uh, possibilities, uh, the, the, the idea that individuals should be able to freely interact and, and the successes that come from this, and that neither socialism nor government intervention are workable uh, substitutes, in fact, to make the, the opportunities for progress and freedom less rather than more. But, but specifically on this article that I want to focus on, is that we are all desperate to see the end of the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel with this coronavirus crisis. We're all tired of being afraid to leave our homes. We're all tired of, of the lockdown that government has imposed upon us. Uh, we want to return to some type of normalcy. So the question has arisen in the media, in, in, in the uh, you know, blog sites and publications, uh, the post-coronavirus world. Now, now, the, the fact, fact is that most of these discussions have worked under an explicit or implicit assumption that when this crisis is, has finished, oh, yes, well, people will have go back to some normal aspects of their market and economic lives and social lives. But that clearly government now has a precedent of a greater responsibility, duty, uh, and paternalistic uh, uh, responsibility to, to guide and direct and, and meet the needs of the people, particularly on the political left. Uh, yeah, the idea is, well, well, this shows that, that we have to continue with this, to have our, our green bill, to impose social justice on the basis of identity politics, and so on and so forth. Uh, and often the analogy is made, Jacob, is, I'm, I'm, I know you've read, you know, this is a war. It's a war against the virus. A war as serious and as dangerous as, oh, we won't face the Nazis in World War II. So following that, uh, and against the progressive democratic socialist agenda that so many on the left hope to be able to push in the, in the post-coronavirus world, I said, the voice who was alive in that Second World War was himself uh, an exile from war-torn Europe uh, during most of the war in the United States, and his name was the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises. And he, in fact, wrote widely and extensively in those early years after arriving in America on the issue of how best for the world to recover. Europe, since that's where it came from, but the world in general, from the destruction and the disruptions and, 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 and the stagnation that war would have caused. How do we return to both freedom and prosperity? So, in fact, through those war years, 1940 through 45, he wrote a series of monographs and gave public speeches. Uh, on basically international reform and reconstruction. Uh, these can be found in a book form uh, called uh, Selective Writings of Ludwig von Mises. This is volume three of the set on uh, the, uh, the, the political economy of, of international reform and reconstruction based upon most of these monographs and speeches he gave in the 1940s. Uh, and so basically what he said is that what we need to return to is a system of free enterprise, limited government, uh, low minimal taxation, reduced government expenditure, balanced budgets, a non-inflationary uh, 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 non monetary system, and giving people in the market as wide a latitude within the general laws of you don't kill, you don't steal, you don't defraud, but within those core, core common uh, basis of social order, giving individuals the greatest latitude uh, for pursuing the, 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 the opportunities that a post-war environment will create for work, savings, and investment, to replace the capital that had been lost. Of course, we've not had a war, we're losing lives, but we've not had the destruction of a war, and for the savings and investment to replace the capital that was, had been used up and to move on to higher standards of living. But, but he, he said, said that, that a number of things were prerequisites to, the, to, to this. And this is part of my theme in this as well. And that is, he said, there has to be a radical change in people's thinking. First of all, there has to be respect for the individual and his right to his life, liberty, and property. There has to be a confidence that contracts, that, 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 that property rights, that, that, that human voluntary associations will be respected 
and, and the lobby of the society, so people have the motives and the incentives to think of creative ways to go about their affairs. Uh, and that part of this said, what governments have destroyed, individual initiative will have to overcome. And that the future of the world is based upon the free competitive entrepreneurs making up for the destruction and the waste that governments will have created. Now, in that setting, he says, well, what are the stumbling blocks to this? And there are several, he says, first of all, we have to stop thinking about the short run. And what did he mean by the short run? Well, think about politics today. Everything is, well, what will get me elected next round? And in the U.S. system, that's every two years with Congress. How can I get a favor, a subsidy, a privilege, a trade protection, a government redistributive handout with no thought of what the long-run consequences are? And what Frederick Bostiak used to say is the difference between the scene and a little bit further down the road, the less easily seen. That had to be given up because short-run policies lead to long-run disasters. Uh, the, the other element of this is that a market cannot operate with vested interests who can use the government for the purposes. So government be separated from the economy. There has to be three free voluntary associations of the market and the associations of civil society uh, through which charity and philanthropy and other activities usually operate. And there must be government with a narrow function to secure rights and not to violate them for some of other people's expenses. And then finally, government must be reduced in size to those narrow and legitimate functions in which budgets are balanced, spending is low, and a monetary system is based upon a commodity such as gold outside of independent government manipulation, control, and abuse. Those are the only foundations upon which a system can, can for freedom and prosperity can be renewed in this post-coronavirus environment. environment. And one of the things I say towards the end of the article, some people say, but that's not a plan. And Mises is very clear about this. He says, that's only because today we have this idea that the only plan is a government plan, as opposed to each individual being allowed to pursue his own plans in a voluntary interactive association with others. And, and then he also pointed out when, when classical liberalism, libertarian ideas were predominant in the 19th century, the proponents and the governments that they could influence did have a plan. And what, what was that plan? plan? Private property, free markets, individual liberty, and allowing people to keep that which they had earned. And as he said, those societies that followed that plan of liberty did very well in terms of prosperity. Uh, and and that, that, that is what is necessary. And as he also says, it is ultimately a moral and, and, and ethical reform that we need. How do you think free people should interact in a healthy society? Through voluntary association or through compulsion and control? Those are the choices we face. Ours can be a free and prosperous society, but not to return to the interventionism and the regulations and the controls that were before the crisis of this virus and have just been intensified in the name of supposedly fighting. Yeah, the, uh, you know, the ancient Chinese symbol for crisis, supposedly, I know some people have questioned it, it actually consists of two separate symbols that have been put together. And one symbol is for danger, and the other symbol is for opportunity. And so they put danger and opportunity together to create the symbol for crisis. Well, we're obviously facing a very dangerous time, this health threat. Uh, but it, it also is an opportunity to cause people to do some soul searching in this country. I mean, you and I have been calling for a new paradigm in economics, health, and uh, monetary affairs for 30 years now, at least. I mean, of course, we were libertarians before FFF was established. But through this foundation, we've, we've been calling for new paradigms for 30 years. And in the economics, at the center of the paradigm is Austrian economics. And... You know, over the years, people have accused us of being too radical or too heartless. I remember when we published our book in 1994 called The Dangers of Socialized Medicine. It was our very first book, very tiny little book. It, it consisted of essays that we had been publishing the first three years of our existence. Um, people were like shocked. You guys want to abolish Medicare and Medicaid? You want to get government out of health care? And you all are heartless. You hate seniors. You hate the poor and all that nonsense that you hear um, as if, you know, the Internal Revenue Service 
is this caring, compassionate entity that effectively steals people's money to fund these programs. It's like this weird type of vicarious charity, uh, vicarious compassion that I'm a compassionate person, Jacob, because I favor the IRS going out and stealing people to provide their health care for them. I mean, it's really weird. But we were calling for a whole new paradigm in that book. We were saying a free market paradigm, just get rid of government entirely, these socialist programs, they're really destroyed. They're, they're the root cause of the out of control healthcare costs that have bankrupted so many people. And uh, before Medicare and Medicaid prices were so low and stable, people just go to the doctors like they go to the, the uh, grocery store, they pay cash. Uh, it was no big deal because prices were so low. Uh, and there was uh, doctors provided free health care for the needy, the poor. You didn't need these two socialist programs. And then now what the coronavirus crisis has reflected and revealed is this centrally planned system is what Mises talked about. All the, all the horrors of central planning, shortages of this, shortages of that. I mean, just look at the Soviet Union. It, they, they, it, they were riddled with shortages and what Mises called planned chaos. I mean, what a great term, planned chaos. What better term to describe the healthcare crisis? Um, and so we, we were talking about that, but we also went further with FF. We've been saying we need a different economic system, a system that's based on the founding economic system of the country where people keep everything they earn, 100%, no withholding at all. And then they decide what to do with it. So no mandatory help for seniors through the IRS with Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. It, the $2 trillion that that is taken out of younger people's pockets, stays with younger people, they can transfer it to their parents just as easily as the IRS can. And, but it leaves people free to manage their own lives, to plan their own lives, which is what you were talking about. It's, it's a spontaneous order where each person is coordinating his activities with others. That's what Austrian economics is all about. But in the process, people are saving gobs of money. I mean, that was America's system for more than 100 years, no income taxation. And it was also the most charitable nation in history. You pointed out in previous programs about how Alexis de Tocqueville came over from, from France and was marveling in the late 1800s of all the voluntary organizations because when people are free to accumulate wealth, they donate a lot of that wealth. That's how the hospitals and the churches and the, the museums and libraries got built, voluntarily. But, you know, when this paradigm shift took place to coercion, it's like a narcotic. All of a sudden, people are brought up in the system of coercion. They think, oh, gosh, seniors would die in the streets, Jacob, but you can't count on younger people. They're selfish. They're bad people. We need to force them to do things. And the market doesn't work. We need a safety net. And then you brought up the monetary issue. I mean, look what they're doing. They've destroyed the finest monetary system in history. Roosevelt did in the 30s. Um, with the Federal Reserve having come into existence in 1913. It was a gold coin standard, silver coin standard. It was a major factor in the rise of the standard of living of the American people. And they just destroyed it. They nationalized gold, just like Stalin was nationalizing property in the Soviet Union. It, it, I consider it one of the most morally abominable acts in U.S. history. It, it's shocking that they just seized people's private property, which had been the official money under the Constitution. And then, of course, they destroyed, uh, wiped out people on fixed incomes over the decades. They drove out of circulation silver quarters and silver dimes. They plundered and looted people through inflation, which is really a tax. It's no different from the income tax. When they feel they can't tax people enough, they then resort to the printing presses. So what we really need is not a way to fix these things. They're not fixable any more than a perpetual motion machine can be fixed. It's not broken. Something broken can conceivably be fixed. It's inherently defective. And this coronavirus crisis is bringing a perfect storm of all three other dysfunctional, inherently defective systems. So what we're doing is what you were saying. We're building the foundation for the future. And people have a choice here. In this crisis, there is danger and opportunity, but there is the opportunity that people have to reject the current way of doing things and come with us who are offering the foundation for the future of this country. Part of the difficulty, difficulty that uh, arises, and in a sense, sense it's inescapable, because each generation only knows the world in which it itself has been born and interacts given the institutions that are in place at that time. And unless uh, individuals out of uh, uh, curiosity uh, wish to ask the question, well, what was the past like? 
Uh, how do people live? How do they solve their problems and go about their daily lives? You have no idea of a different world. Now, you know, you, Medicare and Medicaid have only been around really since the 1960s. They were all part of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society program. And before that, already there was government involvement in healthcare because of the 30s with Roosevelt. But it was pretty much still basically a private system, not a free, unregulated police system, but it was basically a private system. And it was characterized by the way people just saw it, including in television shows. Now, now, maybe, maybe some, some of the older viewers now, like you and me. <laughs> hey, speak for yourself, dude. Uh, we'll, we'll remember a show from the 1960s on television called Marcus Welby, M.D. The, it starred actor Robert Young and has his young doctor assistant, uh, James Brolin, the actor James Brolin, who is in that sci-fi movie Westworld with Yul Brenner. And happens also to be married to Barbara Streisand. But anyway... Uh, what is the imagery of, 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 of Robert Young in this role of Marcus will be MD? He's a family doctor. His office is in his house in some suburban area. I forget what city it was supposed to be, somewhere in the Midwest, I believe. The patients came to his home. He had his, 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 his office there, his examination room. He had some machinery to do some simple testing and anything else he would be sent out. You know, to, to a, a clinic, clinic or a lab. Uh, his, his assistant, James Bowen, would, would visit patients at home. He, he, he Marcus Wally, was, was in a car, car but James Bowen was one of those young whippersnappers on a motorcycle. motorcycle. And, and he, he would drive to, to, to their patients, you know, for, for home visits. And people would just pay themselves with insurance. In fact, it, 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 it wasn't even an issue where, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know, know if I can pay, because Dr. Marcus Welby would always say if there was something, well, don't worry, we'll work it out next time. Uh, I'll, we, we can take, take care of it. But, but that's, that's how, how people, people did these things. things. You didn't need forms to fill out. You didn't need bureaucratic rules. Uh, doctors could price discriminate. That is, you could charge your, your more com financially comfortable patients one price, and for those patients of yours that were economically more limited, poor, if you want to put it that way, well, you, you use the, 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 the patient fees from the, 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 the middle class or upper income patients to cross-subsidize freely and voluntarily to, to provide treatment for those who couldn't cover the real full cost of what you were doing for that, without the state, without regulation, without mandate. That's how people solve these, 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 these social problems such as health care. There were charity hospitals, voluntary hospitals, for profit hospitals. Many of the great hospitals were built by, 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 by rich benefactors in England and the United States in the late second half of the 19th and into the early part of the 20th century. Uh, with, with, with minimal or no cost for those who were indigent and really needed care, no one was turned away. That, that was the tradition of a free society. society. Now, now you, you could, could talk, talk about education the same way. way. You, you could, could talk, talk about retirement processes, processes the same way. way. You, you could, could talk, talk about everything, including business regulation. regulation. There, there were voluntary associations and insurance standards and, and benchmarks that were used uh, within, within the, the private sector, sector long before any of this. But that requires either to be learned from teachers or to have an, a, an acquiring mind to sort of search it out and ask questions yourself by looking at the past. But because people don't do that and don't have the opportunity to do that, they're going to a world in which there's just the interventionist welfare state. It's all around us. And you take for granted, well, that's the government's job. And this is what I get from the government. And that's what I have to pay to the government. And so it is, it is an uphill battle. And it's not an easy one to win. But, but as, as you were suggesting, suggesting, the duty and the responsibility of those people who care about liberty and have done a little bit of homework to know about the history of liberty and how a free society can function, it behooves us, it falls upon us, we must have a sense of an ethical and moral obligation to share what we know with our fellow citizens to save the society in which we live as well from continuing down, down what I call the road to serfdom. Otherwise, there will be no light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, your point is very good about the system under which people grow up. 
Uh, and, and it's aggravated by the fact that from the first grade in these public government schools, kids are indoctrinated with the notion that this is freedom, that what they're growing up in is a free country. I mean, look at the Pledge of Allegiance that everybody's required to do with liberty for all. So it's just drummed into your head from the first grade, your first day in school, you got to memorize it, uh, that you live in a country with liberty for all. So if you look at us around, you say, oh, the state's providing health care for people and retirement for people and education for people and housing for people. This is liberty. This is liberty. So then along comes a libertarian who's broken through all this ridiculous indoctrination and says, we want to get rid of these things. Oh, my gosh, he must be a socialist because he, he's, a, he's against liberty. Well, it's that indoctrination. We understand that all this socialist welfare stuff is not freedom at all. It's the opposite of freedom. Freedom is a society in which people are free to keep everything they earn. They decide what to do with it. And I know I've told this story before, but it bears repeating to reinforce the point you, you're making. I grew up in the poorest city in the United States, Laredo, Texas. That's what the Census Bureau told us. And I mean, people lived literally in shacks. And uh, I mean, a lot of the kids in my high school and junior high were extremely poor. Uh, mostly Mexican Americans. Uh, Laredo's probably about 98% Mexican American. Uh, when we, when I practiced law there in the jury pools, a good 25% of the jury pool could not read or, uh, or write English, and they would be automatically excused from the jury service. Uh, well, doctors' offices were filled with people, and. The doctors knew they couldn't pay, many of them, if not most of them. Many of them were from Nuevo Laredo also, which was even poorer. And it didn't bother doctors. They didn't say, well, you know, how are you going to handle this bill? They just took care of it. And my hunch is they didn't even have a billing system. I mean, grocery stores don't have a billing system. You know, you just come in, we treat them. And, and a lot of times the patients would come back and give tamales to the doctor, you know, or something like that to thank him. But doctors were still among the wealthiest people in town, second only to the oil people. Why? Because as you point out, the wealthier people, the middle class, were paying doctors. Taxes were low. The welfare warfare state had not really blown up. And so income taxes were low. So they were still wealthy. But they, they had meaning in their life. They were given back to the community of giving free uh, health care services to the poor, the needy, seniors, whoever. And it didn't bother them. It was the same thing with the, uh, because they were so wealthy anyway. The, uh, the hospital was Mercy Hospital, a Catholic hospital, only hospital in town. They would do free stuff all the time. How did they survive? With donations, in large part by the wealthier people, the oil people and the, and the doctors and the lawyers and the middle class people, the businessmen. They would donate to fund that hospital. Doctors loved what they did in life. You know, when we get up, I grew up on a farm, as you know, on the Rio Grande, and we'd step on a rusty nail or something, and my dad would call Dr. Malikoff and say, hey, we need a tetanus shot. And Malikoff would say, come on by the house. This would be like a Saturday. We'd drive by the house. He'd come out with his bag. We'd get in his front yard. He'd give us the tetanus shot and say, good to see you all, and we'd go on. This is this is the real meaning of life. And then comes this gigantic, great society welfare state program that just destroyed all that and causing health care costs to skyrocket. How could they not skyrocket? That's when people started needing insurance. Nobody had health care insurance before Medicare and Medicaid, but you had to protect yourself. And then we get reform after reform after reform. And that's the point of our book in 94, The Dangers of Socialized Medicine. None of these reforms are going to work, including the libertarian reforms of health savings accounts. They're not going to work. None of them are going to work. The only thing that works is freedom and free markets. And that's where the self-examination of the American people comes in. People need to do some soul searching here, Richard. And there's nothing like the possibility of death to focus people's minds on reality here. You love this system, stick with it. But you want out of it, join up with libertarianism and support our cause because it's the new paradigm that's going to extricate America for the future. You know, another, another element of this uh, is, is that a free society makes people sensitive to others and social in their behavior and attitudes. Let me give an example of the contrast I want to make. Uh, you know, today, well, in the past, let's suppose that, 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 that you were in a confined space and someone was a smoker in that space. 
Normally, they, they would, would first ask, ask the other people, people let's say, in a train, a car, or something, um, or a waiting room where smoking would be allowed, for example. Do you mind if I light up the cigarette or a pipe of the cigar? And if there was somebody who was a non-smoker, but it really didn't bother them, they would defer to allow the person to enjoy the smoke. Or if it didn't bother them, they'd say, well, really, would you mind if you didn't? And most people courteously would put the cigar or the cigarette or the pipe away. It was considered common courtesy, the way people acted properly. Now, of course, there's always the boorish jerk who would just pull out the cigar like that and give a crap. Well, of course, I mean, there was jerks 2,000 years ago, there were jerks today, and we haven't blown ourselves up, or a meteor hasn't smashed into us, there'll be jerks 1,000 years from now. But in general, people just had these ideas of, of common courtesy and politeness. But, but then, then what did the government, government do beginning in the 1980s, I guess, uh, 1990s? Banning smoking, right? It's, it's not a matter of choice and courtesy and someone being here and while someone's there away from the smoke. No, no smoking in a restaurant. restaurant. No, no smoking, smoking on an airplane. airplane. No, no smoking here. here. No, no smoking there. there. So, so, so what does this create in people's minds? minds? Well, well, you know, you as, know long as long as I do what the, the, the rule says, says then I'm fine. And, and if the rule doesn't exist or, 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 or it's not really very focused on, then I can do what I want. You lose courtesy. Now, why am I bringing this up? You know, there have been the issues of how people should show courtesy and thoughtfulness towards others in this coronavirus situation. It can have, from all the evidence so far, a far more deleterious effect on elderly people. The virus seems to be more prone to impact them, them, particularly if they have preconditions. For some re way, reason that, that science has not been able to figure out yet, it seems to demographically affect certain racial and ethnic groups more than others in terms of the number of cases reported and the number out of, out of total deaths. Now, the, 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 the state and, and county governments declare, you know, parks closed and beaches closed and people, people are forced to be off those public areas. areas. Then, then, you know, a county, uh, a government, or a governor, was no parts of, of it. Or, and some people, other people just rush us to the beach, and, you know, there might be elderly people there, or do, do, they, do they say, oh, you know, let me stay away from you, or do they think when a public space, maybe as a precaution, they should wear a mask? Because they say the masks are more important not, not to protect, protect yourself, but to protect another person. person. Do, 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 I'm walking around here in South Carolina where they still have part of the restrictions in effect, a lot of restrictions. Like, no. Do, do they, they wear gloves? Do they wear masks? Most people don't. Now, I would suggest that there will always be people who are thoughtless and careless. We're imperfect people who sometimes act stupidly. But if, if governments had not been involved in this, and, and it was, was a matter, matter of individual, individual responsibility, responsibility and the rules, the unwritten and, and informal rules of, of civil society, of, of, of like tra tradition and custom and, and viewed as proper etiquette and good behavior. A lot of people today, without the law of government saying no, or yes, you can be out in public, you can go to a beach, you can shop in the store, would be more conscious because it was their responsibility, and not an order from the government, to think about how they're interacting with each other. Are they being careful around others? Are they being thoughtful around others? It's the government's heavy hand of the regulations that desensitizes us to our sense of, of humanity and thoughtfulness towards others. And that has made us less of a good society. Absolutely. And it also, it, it denigrates and stultifies and paralyzes conscience that, yeah. you know, through these mandatory programs, you will share with your parents, you will share with your grandparents, you will share with the poor and needy through the force of the IRS. It stultifies conscience, the exercise of conscience. You know, if that, if that $2 trillion were left in the hands of younger people, they would have to say, well, should I use this money for this? Or should I use my money for that? Should I buy a new car? Should I donate to the church? These are all things that cause the conscience to, to get exercised that then elevates it and it nudges people toward higher levels of consciousness and correct behavior. Uh, 
with a welfare state way of life, it paralyzes that process. And it makes people more cynical, too. It's like, yeah. why should I do that? The government's job is that's the government's job. All right, we're out of time, Richard. But you want to wrap up with any last words? Just, just, just a concluding thought. It is freedom and a free society that does not make us selfish. It makes us thoughtful and considerate and polite and courteous towards our fellow human beings. Because here it is based upon our actions and not a command. And that is why we have the problems we have today, including in the interactions among people with this virus, rather than the freedom and better outcomes of social interaction we could have in a far more freer society. Right. I just would, would add to that the little cherry on top that libertarianism and freedom is the only philosophy that's consistent with re the religious principle of free will. I mean, God vests man with free will and because he trusts them to make the right decision. But even if they don't, that's the essence of freedom. If, you, if you're not free to say no, then you're not free. And yet government comes along and says, well, God made a mistake. You should never have trusted people with that kind of freedom because, you know, they can't be trusted. We need a safety net to take care of that. Well, that's just nonsense. God doesn't make mistakes. All right, Richard, on that note, we'll wrap things up and uh, enjoy the conversation. Look forward to seeing you next week. Until, Until next time, time I, I just want to say, say thank, thank you to our viewers and listeners, listeners for sharing sure. a little bit of their time with us. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. And again, subscribe to our YouTube channel and come and visit us at FFF.org. If you want to know more about libertarianism, write us emails. Uh, jhornberger at fff.org and send us there for Richard too. We'll forward it to him. And thanks for tuning in. We'll see you all next week.